However, we must remember the wounds as described by many of the treatment staff at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. The only wounds noted at Parkland during treatment on the day the president was shot was an entry wound in the front of the neck and a gaping avulsed exploded exit wound in the right rear quadrant of the head. Was the bag of care signal really gone? No. It was? Okay. We had no brain left. It was blown out. I had to go and look at the Yet the photos and x-rays from the autopsy clearly tell a different story. They depict images unlike anything seen in Dallas by the treatment staff and images that do not correspond properly with what was seen by people present at the autopsy.
something there every day. That's basically what we were wondering, yeah. The only, only really bullet one you can see was Charlotte King. Okay. And they did a trichotomy on that, too. And so, yeah. in your opinion, was it a small entrance wound? Was it a small entrance wound? Or do you think it was a nice one? In your opinion? The Charlotte? No, in my opinion, I think it's where the bullet come out. You think it's where the bullet come out? Okay, so you think it's an exit wound, but as far as the back of the head, that, that appeared to be gone to you, or? Yeah, it was gone. Oh, uh, okay. Where? Where? Here? No, right back. In the middle. I think it's yeah. that whole thing here, I can feel it right there. And back, right, almost in the middle of the back of the head, yeah. you know, just a side a little bit. Mm -hmm. Wow. I want you to do me a favor. Sure. And I'd like you to, to put, tell me where the, the wound in the head was located, yeah. to the best of your recollection. The wound in the head? Yeah. To the best of my recollection, it was in the frontal sinus on the right hand side, just above the orbit. Right about here. Okay, now you claim that that's the entry wound, you would that's think? That's the entry okay, wound. Okay, now how about the exit wound? Where we I know exactly where the bullet came through, and I, when you track the bullet backwards, in other words, I have the bullet coming right through his head, I have his scalp in the air, I have his skull, it and it came in right about here, right about his eye. Yeah. If you just track that down, okay, the hole from the missile, uh -huh. it comes out right here, so it had to go in right about in here. And it came out here? Absolutely, I have it. I have it. Uh -huh. That's a pruner thing. So, um, I'm a memory western as good as I thought. What? My memory wasn't as good as I thought then. Because the con I remember well, that Connor. When, when I'm interviewing you, don't be colored yeah. by anything yeah, he says. Yeah. I shouldn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. The location of the head wound is key evidence. Since a bullet almost always makes a small wound when it enters and a large wound when it exits, a big wound at the back of JFK's head would indicate a shot from the front and more than one shooter. Most of the doctors and nurses who treated the president at Parkland did see a large wound at the rear of the head. Dr. Robert McClelland. It was in the right back part of the head, very large. Nurse Audrey Bell. All, there was a massive wound at the back of his head. Dr. Charles Carrico. There was a, uh, a, a large, uh, quite a large defect about here on his, on his skull. Dr. Ronald Jones. Well, my impression was that, that there was a wound in, in this area of the head, right in, right in this area. But six of the Dallas doctors testified they saw a part of the brain called the cerebellum protruding from the president's head wound. The cerebellum is located at the extreme back of the head. And a portion of the cerebellum fell out onto the table as we were doing the, uh, the tracheostomy. It did. Mm -hmm. So the wound was very far back here. Right. That's one of my more vivid memories, I would say, of the whole thing. Was that was particularly uh, grim to see that portion of the brain ooze out of the wound as I sat there looking at it, stood there looking at it. So that stays with you pretty, pretty much. But now, some of the Dallas doctors, like Marion Jenkins, are changing their stories. As late as 1977, Jenkins was saying he had seen the cerebellum protruding from JFK's head wound, meaning the wound was far to the rear. But recently, Jenkins had his first look at the official photos and x-rays. Well, after looking at photo photographs, some made from this angle, looking down at the top of the head, it did look like cerebellum. It still looks like it, but it's obviously not. I'm not trying to defend it. I've made an error, and I have been, but I say I make errors. I call my kids the wrong names. The Dallas doctor's recollections about an exit wound in the back of the president's head are confirmed by witnesses at the Bethesda Hospital autopsy. I mean, a big gaping hole in the back of the head. Floyd Reby, a photographer on duty, talked with Wayne Friedman. It was like somebody put a piece of dynamite in a tin can and light it off. There was nothing there. Open area all the way across into the rear of the, the brain like that. From the top of the head almost back to the near the base of the skull. You could see where that part was gone. So eyewitnesses in Dallas and Bethesda describe a wound extending all the way to the back of the head. 
but official autopsy photos and x-rays move the wound all the way to the front of the head. The photos show the back of the head with hair and scalp intact. No large wound. The x-rays show a large wound extending to the forehead. Certainly I can tell you that the wound was not here. There was no damage to the face uh, that was visible. What about the official photos and x-rays? We showed them to the three eyewitnesses to JFK's autopsy. Photos and x-rays not available to the public since the assassination, but recently obtained by the press. Gerald Custer took the x-rays that night. Is this the x-ray picture that you took, and is this the wound that you saw on the president? This area here mm -hmm. was gone. Not this area? Not this area. Floyd Reby assisted with the autopsy photos. The two pictures that I've seen that you showed me that are supposedly from the archives are not what I saw that night. Now, I don't know where those pictures came from. The back of the head looked like that? What did the back no, of the head look like? It had a big hole in it. This whole area was gone. Does that look like what you saw? No, no, it doesn't look like what I saw. This, this would be... Uh, a lesser of a wound than what I saw. I saw a, a lot worse wound uh, that extended way back into this area here. Was the president's hair and scalp like that? No. What was it like? This part of the head was gone. There was no scalp there. Are you telling me that this is not? I don't believe so. You, you don't think this is an no. honest-to-God no. autopsy photo? No, I don't. What do you think it is? I don't know. It's being phonied someplace. It's make-believe. To me, it's rather obvious that the president had been struck before Governor Conley was wounded because the president was placing his hand up to his throat. And at that time, the uh, governor was showing no signs of any distress that he had been struck in any way. It was a f just a few frames later that uh, he uh, obviously had been wounded and showed signs that he was in pain. The commission claimed that Governor Conley had simply suffered a delayed reaction to his wounds. Dr. Robert Shaw was the attending surgeon at Parkland Hospital who operated on the governor. I would disagree because I don't think that there would be a delayed action to a wound uh, that was as massive as the wound he received of his chest. And I'm also influenced by what Nellie Conley said. She said that her husband was struck and reared up like a wounded animal before she heard the bullet, I mean, heard the shot that had been fired. So this would indicate uh, that uh, his reaction was almost immediate. This bullet is too pristine for a bullet that had uh, shattered a rib and also badly shattered the radius, which is a good strong bone uh, I am sure that the bullet that inflicted these wounds on Governor Conley was fragmented much more than this bullet shows this is the bullet could it look like this after it went through Kennedy's neck and then struck the governor the surgeon who operated on Governor Conley's chest wounds at Parkland Hospital was Dr. Robert Shaw the bullet struck lateral to the shoulder blade, stripped out approximately 10 centimeters of the fifth rib, driving fragments of the rib into his chest, went on and struck his, the radius bone of his lower arm at this point, and a small fragment of bullet entered the inner aspect of the lower left thigh. I have never seen a bullet that had caused as much bony damage as you found in the case of Governor Connolly remain as a pristine bullet. But looking at the wounds, Dr. Shaw disagrees. 
I couldn't quite understand why a bullet going through the president's neck, coming from the right and above, exiting out through his throat, would then zig and zag to strike the governor who was sitting directly in front of the president. It would seem to me that that bullet would have struck the governor in the left side of his chest rather than the right side of his chest. It looked small and round, like an entry wound, instead of larger, like an exit wound could uh, often look. Had surgery been done in Dallas? No, there was no surgery done on the president's head. The president was only treated in the trauma room, in the emergency room. I could see the president's uh, head wound quite well, and um, I was probably looking into a wound that was on the lateral or the side part of the head and the back part of the head. It would be this portion of the head right here. As I remember, it's like this. I would have to say, uh, honestly, in looking at these photos, they're pretty much as I remember President Kennedy at the time, except for that little incision that seems to be coming down in the parietal area. Uh, on looking at the photographs, I could envision that an incision might have been made in order to pull the scalp back to expose this bone to make a photograph of that area. Perhaps this explains the surgery to the head area the FBI mentioned. I find no discrepancy between the wounds as they're shown very vividly in these photographs and what I remember very vividly. There was a very large but do the doctor's assertions that they saw no altered wounds clear up the issue? The drawing suggests what many of the photos examined by the doctors in Nova show a large wound about this size and location. But what about this photo, which shows what appears to be only a small entry wound in the back of Kennedy's head? Dr. McClellan speculates. The pathologist has taken this loose piece of scalp, which is hanging back this way in most of the pictures, exposing this large wound, and has pulled the scalp forward to take a picture, naturally, the scalp appears to be in its normal state, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of wound in the area where I had drawn the picture that showed this large hole. But doesn't this large wound suggest a shot from the front, as Lifton argues? This drawing made for Congress suggests how a small rear entry wound could have created the large wound. Finally, if the large wound was really in this part of the head, why did most of the doctors note back in 1963 that they had seen a specific part of the brain called the cerebellum? I did say cerebellum in my first official report. And the cerebellum ordinarily is in a posterior part. And here I knew very well that the wound was more anterior than that, but there was a portion of the brain that looked like it had a stalk and it was convoluted to look like uh, what I thought was cerebellum. I said that I thought perhaps part of the cerebellum was missing. Former Senator John Sherman Cooper is the first member of the Warren Commission to agree to talk on television about what went on inside the deliberations. Yes, there were disagreements. Uh, I think the most uh, serious, well, one of the ones that comes to me the most vividly, of course, was the question of whether or not the first shot went through President Kennedy and then through Governor Connolly, who was sitting on the jump seat in front of him. I heard Governor Connolly testify very strongly that uh, he was not struck with the same bullet. And I could not convince myself that the same bullet uh, struck both of them, although uh, you had experts who said it could. And you mean that you yourself 
didn't weren't convinced about the single bullet theory, which no, I wasn't convinced by it. Neither was Senator Russell. Just before he died in 1971, Senator Russell caused the first cracks in the Warren Commission's Gibraltar of factual literature. Russell said publicly, I think someone else worked with Lee Harvey Oswald. Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry was in the fatal motorcade just ahead of the president and cannot accept the Warren Commission view that the only shot came from behind. I think there's a possibility that one could have come from, the, from in front of us. We were never, we've never been able to prove that. But just in my mind, and by the uh, direction of the, of the blood and brain from the president from one of the shots, it, j it would just seem that uh, it ha would have to be fired from the front rather than behind. I can't say that I would, could swear that I believe there was one man and one man alone. I think that there's a possibility there could have been another man. Jesse Curry was Dallas police chief at the time of the assassination. First off, approximately right along here. I would say. Did you, you didn't look back at that point? No, I looked in a rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, you've seen the uh, Zapruder film that was taken from up this hill. Uh -huh. And there's a very distinct head snap where the president kind of right. is hit backwards. Mm -hmm. and doesn't that suggest that the shot would have come from the Well, it would hill? appear to be so. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same, we also have Dr. Malcolm Perry at Parkland Hospital saying that he examined the wound in the president's throat and it was an entrance wound. Yes. Uh -huh. Which would also suggest that the, the shot had come from the front. I'm not saying the shot was not fired from here. I'm saying we never found anybody that we could connect with. It. But, it, but it, it, it does suggest that the evidence right. that we have is in both cases rather strong evidence mm -hmm. that there was another assassin involved. That's right. his neck and then by that time there was, there was two falling shots just like a pow pow in less than two seconds pulling mrs kennedy down into her seat protecting her she had climbed out of the back and she was on the way back right and because of the fact that part of his, her husband's head had been shot off and gone off to the street she wasn't she wasn't trying to climb out of the car she was no she was simply trying to reach that head part of the head to bring it back it's the only thing before i got there he had uh, been shot again in the head when i got to the car mrs kennedy was coming out on the back of the trunk of the car appeared to me that she was attempting to retrieve part of his head that had been blown off. By the time I got there, two more shots had been fired and he had been hit in the head. When I slipped, when I first tried to get up on the presidential car, it took me four or five steps more in order to get up there. And in that time, Mrs. Kennedy was out on top of the trunk attempting to grasp part of the president's head that had been blown off and had fallen into the street. I had to run three or four more steps before I could get out. By that time, Mrs. Kennedy had come out under the trunk and was seeming, it appeared to me to be searching for something or trying to retrieve something. But I got up on the back of the car and placed her back in the seat. The president at that time has slipped down into her lap. I could see the back of his head, and there was a gaping hole above his right ear, about the size of my palm. And there was white brain matter and red blood throughout the entire car. I could see into the skull, there was a hole in his skull, and you could see that part of the brain was gone. It wasn't even there. At Parkland Hospital, Dr. Malcolm Perry, assistant professor of surgery at Southwestern Medical School, was on duty when the mortally wounded president was brought to the emergency room. But there was a neck wound anteriorly and a large wound to his head and the right posterior area. But there was a neck wound anteriorly and a large wound to his head and the right posterior area. Okay, so you think it's an excellent one, but as far as the back of the head, that, that appeared to be gone to you? Or, you know, oh, okay. Where? Where? Here? No, right back. 
try frantically to save her 46-year-old husband's life in trauma room one. He really didn't do an awful lot, but I was, I was convinced in my own mind that he wasn't going to make it. Right here. It was all gone. Husband's life in trauma room one. He really didn't do an awful lot. It was all gone. He really didn't do The Warren Commission ignored the film evidence of a shot from the front. They were also selective in their choice of eyewitness testimony. Two members of the Willis family told them of hearing shots fired from behind the president's car. However, other vital evidence they tried to offer went unrecorded. The implication was persuading, yes, ma'am, because uh, all they wanted to know was three shots that, that probably came from the depository building, which I never have doubted. That's about all they wanted. They about all got into the one commission. Really, that I heard three loud shots from the Texas depository. The headshot seemed to come from the right front. It seemed to strike him here, and uh, his head went back, and it, all of the brain matter went out the back of the head. It was like a red halo, a red circle with bright matter in the middle of it. It just went like that. It, it was a, a terrible time. You cannot imagine seeing this. You You knew it happened, but... You didn't want to believe it. The particular headshot must have come from another direction besides behind him because the back of his head blew off and it doesn't make sense to be hit from the rear and still have your face intact. So he must have been hit from another position, you know, possibly, you know, in the front or over to the side. I, I really don't know where. But the back of his head blew off. So I am very dead certain at least one shot, including the one that took the president's skull off, had to come from the right front. And I'll stand by that to my death, over my mother's grave. The doctors at Parkland Hospital, who tended the president minutes after the assassination, also saw a head wound compatible with a shot from the front. I can see that he had a large, uh, about seven centimeter opening in the right occipital parietal area. A considerable portion of the brain was missing there, and uh, the occipital cortex, the back portion of the brain, was lying down near the opening of the wound, and blood was trickling out. Almost a fifth, or perhaps even a quarter, of the right back part of the head in this area here had been blasted out, along with probably most of the brain tissue in that area. Dr. Crenshaw says they're wrong. The bullet struck about where and passed about where? From here right. through. And taking out the... The back or the occipital part. The back of your head. This was gone 
uh, in our view, and we, that's the reason we could see the cerebellum. Had the bullet come from the back, uh, what would have been the difference? It the would one? have been much different. It would have gone a little more anterior and be a bigger blaster. Right. The second wound? The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening, very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. In a slow motion study of the film, President Kennedy grabs his throat with both hands, reacting, Crenshaw believes, as if he is shot from the front. At first, most of the doctors working on the president believe the small neck wound they observed to be an entry wound from the front. But a later autopsy from Bethesda Naval Hospital showed another previously undetected wound in the back, which the Dallas medical team had not found. This discovery made the Parkland doctors less certain in their initial conclusion that the shots came from the front. Dr. Charles Baxter, a senior member of the surgical team, believes it's impossible to tell the direction. Could it have been a bullet wound that came from the front? Oh, I think it could have, as well as from behind. Because the wound in the back and the wound in the front were essentially the same in appearance, both of them look like entry wounds. Mm. Uh, bullets, as they go in, begin to tumble, spin, and when they come out, they explode, so that the exit wound is always much larger and a lot more tissue damage. So what would appear clinically as an entry wound became question mark. Right. And that's the way it still stays today in my mind. Compounding the mystery is this photograph of the government's autopsy, showing a gaping wound in the president's neck. A tracheostomy incision was done at Parkland over the site of the bullet wound. Crenshaw says someone tampered with that wound after he last saw Kennedy's body, making it larger to resemble a bullet exit wound. Look, this is the size of the tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. Incision was made and then placed in. This large part, this flange, stays outside. So it was a small wound about the size of the, the instrument uh, that uh, you right. saw. An inch to an inch and a half maximum. This wound, and described in the Warren Commission, was almost three inches wide. Double the size. Then. Double. Is it possible that the doctor uh, working to put this in what may have been already a bullet wound uh, made the incision too large? Oh, no. No, Perry was an artist with the blade. Mm. He was one of the best trained technical surgeons. But it seems almost incomprehensible that a team of highly intelligent, highly trained doctors could be standing over the President of the United States and see wounds that you say came from the front and yet the official government story is it came from the back and wait this long to break the silence. Intimidation, fear. Hume's probed with his finger, first of all. Uh, no point of exit. And then he probed with a small surgical probe. No point of exit. The doctors were baffled. Then a call came in from the FBI. A quote, pristine bullet had been found on a stretcher in Dallas. Could it have fallen out of Kennedy's back as doctors tried to save him with cardiac massage? And the doctor said, well, there's no question about it. That's what happened. That is it. Relieved, Humes went no further. And over the last 40 years, the integrity of the autopsy has come into question because the paths of the bullets were never properly traced. A massive wound in the right rear. Now, I'm not going to use medical terms because I'm not familiar with them. Mm -hmm. But from a layman's point of view, it was from the right rear. Um, and uh, so uh, immediately, uh, this part uh, is just Im embedded in my brain. Is just this part of his uh, head was blown away and the brains were exposed. The calvarium uh, had slipped behind his head and was still connected by, by the, the scalp and the base. We zijn onderweg naar Tom Robinson in de plaats Winterhaven in de buurt van de stad Tampa. Hij was destijds belast met het toonbaar maken van Kennedy's lichaam voor de begrafenis. Who else was present at that moment? Oh, lots of people. What kind of officials, for instance? I really don't know. Um, I had a job to do. I was under pressure. Many times they called down and said, how long are you going to be? How long are you going to be? How long are you going to be? Hmm. But we couldn't rush it. We had to take our time. 
And were the people from the FBI or CIA? Oh, yes. Or? They were all over the place. Mm. I talked to some, but I, I can't remember who they are or what their jobs were. I did talk to one gentleman that was a ballistics expert, and he held a test tube with pieces of shrapnel that uh, the pathologist had uh, picked out of the skull. Mm -hmm. And there were about that many in the bottom of a, like a test tube. What do you remember about the wounds uh, you, wit uh, you witnessed? Well, the one at the back of the head, of course, is the major one. That's the one that took him, one that killed him. It's like that. But it's right here, right at the medulla. Yeah. What happened to the brains of the president? It was removed. Of course, the back portion of the brain was badly torn up. Mm. And it was put into a jar and taken away. And am I right that the brains are still uh, lost, disappeared? Well, that's what I heard, that they disappeared. Isn't that strange? It's very strange. President Kennedy has been shot by a would-be assassin in Dallas, Texas. Going to park, code three. This is a shot of the emergency room where President Kennedy died on Friday. Tonight, exclusive. The doctors who try to save JFK relive that awful day inside Trauma One at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. Their vivid memories of the president on the operating table as Jackie Kennedy looked on in shock and horror. Plus Bob Schieffer, the veteran CBS newsman who was in Dallas that day and personally brought Lee Harvey Oswald's mother to the police station. The whole story next on Larry King Live. We have quite a panel assembled for you tonight in Washington with us. Is Bob Schieffer, the anchor and moderator of CBS News' Face the Nation, was a police reporter for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram on this date 40 years ago. Also here's Dr. Ronald Jones, one of the first doctors to see the president at Parkland Hospital. He worked on Kennedy in the trauma room, was then chief resident of surgery. He was 31 years old at the time. Two days later, he treated Lee Harvey Oswald. He's now chief of surgery at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. In Parkland is Dr. Charles Baxter. Dr. Baxter was in charge of the emergency room at Parkland that day, helped treat the president, has vivid recollections of Mrs. Kennedy in the trauma room. Here in Washington is Dr. Robert Grossman, a doctor in the trauma room treating Kennedy, 30 years old then, in his first job. He was an instructor in neurosurgery, he examined the head, now professor and chairman at the Department of Neurosurgery at Baylor College of Medicine. And in Dallas is Gary Mack. Gary is curator, sixth floor museum at Dealey Plaza. That's the Texas School Book Depository building where Lee Harvey Oswald is believed to have fired at President Kennedy, the first to theorize, by the way, that the Dallas Police Department may have unknowingly recorded the assassination. Later, we'll be joined by two other doctors, and we'll introduce them to you then. We'll start with Dr. Jones. When did you first, what were you doing at the moment you heard? Dr. Malcolm Perry and I had been finishing a vascular procedure and came down to the cafeteria in the main hospital. We were eating lunch and over the loudspeaker came some stat pages for the chief of surgery and the chief of neurosurgery. Very unusual for that to happen and this was repeated a couple stat of times. Stat page meaning? Meaning answer immediately. And uh, so I got up and went to the front of the cafeteria to a telephone and called the operator and I said, what are you paging uh, everyone's stat for? And she said, uh, the president's been shot and they're bringing him to the emergency room and they need physicians right away. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. Remember your first thought? Well, you had this sudden rush of adrenaline, this flush of the face, palpitations probably, and you realize that you were going to be treating the president of the United States. Dr. Baxter, were you in the emergency room? No. I was in the student health service. Did you get that same page? 
No, I got a phone call from the head nurse in the emergency room, Doris Nelson, and she said, come quickly, the president's been shot. And I, being brothers from my mind, I said, well, what else is new today, Doris? <laughs> and she said, I'm not kidding. And I, there was never another word spoken. I took off running for the emergency room. Dr. Robert Grossman, were you in the trauma room? At the time, we also got a phone call. I was sitting in my lab in the medical school building. You were all young guys. We were all young. I was chatting with Kemp Clark, the chairman of our department, and I got a phone call saying the president's been shot, come to the emergency room. I told Kemp, and we thought it was a prank, but then we looked at each other, and we also started running. Gary, you are the curator of the museum, so what were you doing then? Well, I was... I was a senior in high school in Denver, Colorado, and like all these uh, gentlemen uh, speaking with you, I remember vividly where I was and what I was doing. Sure Did do. the teacher announce it? Yeah, the vice principal walked in. He stood right next to our table. This was in the, in the cafeteria. Was having, we were having lunch, and he just stood there, and his bottom lip was quivering. It was very odd, and gradually all, all the noise and, and that died down, and he made the announcement. Of course, we were all just stunned, but I remember the, I remember the tiniest things, like I was eating cream of potato soup. Um, <laughs> and, and the weekend ended, you know, went on from there. Bob, where were you? Well, I was sound asleep. Uh, I was the night police reporter at the Star Telegram, so I didn't get off till three o'clock in the morning. My brother Tom, who was in high school, our mother had given him permission to stay out of school so he could go and see the president, uh, who spoke uh, at a breakfast in, in Fort, Fort Worth, Worth that morning. And in fact. Tom was one of the last people in Fort Worth to shake hands with the president. He'd somehow wiggled his way over next to the limo, and when the president got ready to get in, uh, he shook his hand. But anyway, uh, he came and woke me, and he said, you better get to work. The president's been shot. Well, it's, you know, you're sound asleep. It was, uh, I'll, I'll never forget it. I dressed as quickly as I could. I got to the newspaper. As I was driving down there, he came over the radio. He was dead, and I just, you know, I, I lost it. I mean, we didn't know, Larry, what had happened. I mean, you know, nothing like this had ever happened. I mean, we didn't know if we were under attack from the Soviet Union. We didn't know what this was about. They'd closed off the borders to Mexico. Uh, but I got to the city desk. I was just trying to help out. I grabbed a phone, and a woman said, anybody there can give me a ride to Dallas. And I said, lady, you know, well, this is not the taxi service. Well, you know the rest of the story. She said, yes, I heard it on the radio. I think uh, my son is the one they've arrested. And it was Lee Harvey you Oswald's drove his mother, to mother. Dallas. So another reporter and I drove her to the Dallas police station. All right, Dr. Jones. What happened? You were one of the first to see him, right? Right. Brought I, in on a stretcher? When I turned around from answering the phone, I told Dr. Jenkins, Chief of Anesthesia, and Audrey Bell was the op operating room supervisor that the president had been shot. And he said, well, I'll get an anesthesia machine down there. And she said, I'll get the OR ready, because we thought he was probably <coughs> shot, but we would be able to resuscitate him and operate, and, uh, and he would survive. But I told Dr. Perry, we ran out of the backside of the cafeteria, down some steps, into the emergency room, and went to trauma room one and two. The door to trauma room two was closed, and that was where Connolly was. We didn't know he had been injured. And we went into trauma room one. Ms. Kennedy was on the left, and as I looked at him, he was motionless. He was staring. His eyes were open, and uh, I never saw any, any evidence of life but I saw a small hole in the midline of the, of the neck, just below the Adam's apple, and I knew that he had a, a, an injury to the back of his head. Dr. Carrico was the second year resident and uh, was trying to place an endotracheal tube into the windpipe to uh, gain access for an airway. Did you know he was dead? Dr. Carrico had indicated that he thought he saw some agonal respirations but that was what triggered the effort to resuscitation. But if you looked at him, he looked like he was morbid, and um, he, in retrospect, he probably was. Dr. Baxter, what's the first thing you noticed? I thought that he was having a few breathing, uh, that he was breathing a few breaths, and we could uh, barely hear a heartbeat. And uh, EKG was hooked up very rapidly, and his heart was, in fact, beating, but uh, he was obviously agonal. Uh, he just had every appearance, as Ron described. We'll take a break and be back with more on this special edition of Larry King Live. Don't go away. This is the scene at Dallas's Parkland Hospital as the body of President Kennedy was brought out and taken to Dallas's Love Field to be flown yes, to Washington. Is. The body is now en route by plane to Washington. Also en route to Washington is 
the 36th president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Dr. Grossman, Robert Grossman, you examined the head wound? Yes. <clears throat> when Dr. Clark and I came in, he was surrounded by physicians, as Dr. Jones said, trying to resuscitate him. And you could see that the right side of his head had suffered a major wound. But I don't think anyone had a time to examine him closely. So Kemp and I went to the head of the stretcher, Kemp on the left, I on the right, and we lifted up his head. He had very thick, bristly hair. and when you parted the hair, you could see that the right posterior part of the head, back here, right where I'm putting my hand, this part was simply blasted out. There was a large plate of bone that was hinged upward, and you could see the brain tissue was all macerated and white. As Ron said, there was no active bleeding. Then we lifted his head up further, and he had a small opening in the back of his head. I've, I've got a skull model here I could show now or later but I can show people where it was. <clears throat> there, uh, <clears throat> we lifted his head up like this, and you could see in the back here there was an opening about the size of a quarter, which was clearly a bullet entry wound. And then there was this massive gaping wound on the side of his head with a plate of bone blown up. So, so he was dead. I thought that also that I saw some gasping that he was trying to fight the respirator, but it was perfectly clear that he could not live very long. I thought he might remain in a coma for some hours or even some days with the brain stem intact, and the whole attention of the world would be focused on Parkland at that point. But uh, <clears throat> it was clear to me that a bullet had entered the back of his head and blasted out this part of his head. This was an exit wound. As you so know, there was a little hole in the front of the neck. There was a hole in the front of the neck, which everyone thought was an entry wound. But as you know, that we did not undress him when it was clear that he was dead. I think, out of respect for a dead person and respect for the president, we did not undress him. Was Mrs. Kennedy in the room? As Ron said, I was glad to see all my this time. Yes, when I entered, she was at the left of the door as uh, as Dr. Perry and I entered, and as we looked at him. Uh, between us, we said, Dr. Perry will do the tracheotomy, and I'll do a venous section here to isolate a vein to get IV fluids and, and blood going, and so that's what we started with. So you're with. doing what doctors do. You're doing everything you, you, you can. You've got an airway, and you're trying Would to you get IV done access. That with any patient in that condition? Yes, and that was, I think, we saw a lot of trauma and a lot of gunshot wounds at that time, and this was a reflex that you automatically do. I think if you'd had to stop and think about it, and knowing as the President of the United States, it might have been a little harder. But I think most of us thought this was an entrance wound and, and the back of the head was an exit wound. Dr. Baxter, what was Mrs. Kennedy doing in that room all that time? Uh, Mrs. Kennedy was in the room and sort of circling around. Uh, and I asked her to please wait outside and had the nurse to escort her outside to a chair right outside the room. Uh, it's, uh, I explained to her that it was not going to be pretty, and then we uh, turned to work on the chest. Uh, Dr. Carrico was having trouble ventilating the patient, and uh, we put a chest tube in on the left. Uh, then we thought the bullet hole in his neck, uh, or rather the, into the little wound, very small wound in his neck, and we proceeded with the tracheostomy, and there was very little tissue damage there, not uh, anything that uh, it would cause any problems with breathing. But we did get an endotracheal tube in, and we're sure that we had him adequately ventilated. And of course, it uh, didn't help at all. Who pronounced him dead, Dr. Grossman? Dr. Clark did. He was the most senior surgeon there. He was 38. and. Uh, can you tell us what determines he was dead? Because we could not get the heart started. There was cardiac massage, 
EKG showed no organized activity, and after about 15 minutes of very intensive work, it was clear his heart couldn't be started. What are you, what's going through you? This is not just another patient. I mean, I know you're working hard, and you would if it were a Thursday night shooting of an alcoholic in a bar, you'd be working this way. But it's not an alcoholic on a Thursday night in a bar. It's the presence. Well, what's I think going as Bob you? Schieffer said, everyone's mind, I think, said, what does this mean for the country? Is this the start of World War III? So you're thinking that at the same time you're, you work? Absolutely. You're thinking of that. And also, there was an awesome feeling, because you knew he was the president. He, there was almost an aura about him, which almost seemed to fade as he died, even though I'm not a superstitious person. There was really quite was a... There was an aura. I, it seemed to be... I was really very in, in awe of, of the situation. I, I'm just wondering, listening to the doctors, uh, you thought at the beginning that the, this wound was an entrance wound. Did that lead you to believe that this shot, as you came to know what we all know about now, uh, could not have come from above and behind the president? Or are you satisfied, I guess is what I'm saying, with the conclusion the Warren Commission came to? I think if you look at the autopsy report and all the other re-reviews, I think it's clear that the neck wound was an exit wound. The bullet entered... It looked that way at the beginning to you? It, it looked like an entrance wound, but there is no way of telling whether mm -hmm. entrance or exit and nobody... The autopsy makes it clear? Was it I think it? it was clear that right, the bullet me... went in the back and came out the neck. We'll get a break and come right back. We'll ask Gary about the museum and lots more on this incredible day. Don't go away. Back. Joining us now from Parkland Hospital for a few moments is Dr. Adolf Gieske. He was staff anesthesiologist on that day. He attached the EKG monitor. Was he given anesthesia, doctor? No, he was not given any anesthesia, only resuscitation. Did you know that you were fighting a losing cause? Uh, I really didn't stay in the room long enough to tell. Uh, when, uh, like Dr. Jones, I was in the cafeteria uh, sitting at the same table with Dr. Jenkins when the news came that the president had been shot, Dr. Jenkins ordered me to go to the operating room to get some equipment, which I did. Dr. Jenkins went on directly to the emergency room. I came to the emergency room with an electrocardiographic monitor, which wasn't routine equipment in the emergency room in those days, and an anesthesia machine. Uh, Dr. Jenkins asked me to hook up the electrocardiographic monitor which I did with needle electrodes. Those little patch electrodes mm -hmm. are a product of the space exploration and uh, were not available in 1963. Then uh, after I hooked up the, re the electrocardiogram, my recollection was that there was no activity on the EKG. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I was called across the, room, across the hall uh, to take care of the governor. Governor Conley was also injured in that episode and I'd spent the rest of the day with the governor. I gave the governor's anesthetic, and uh, so that was very time wow. consuming. By the way, how, uh, I'll ask you, Gary, how does the museum treat all this? Do you deal, deal with all what happened at the hospital, or do you deal only with what happened at Dealey Plaza? Oh, we cover the entire subject as best we can in a neutral way, and, and one of the difficulties, and, and this has come up in the show already, is, is how to make some sense of some of these things. For example, most of the medical people at Parkland describe a, a big hole in the president's head in the rear or right rear, and yet the autopsy photographs and x-rays of the body don't show a big hole over here. And how do you make sense of all that? Dr. Jones? I think the explanation for it is that uh, some of those films that I mean pictures that were taken at the autopsy had pulled the scalp up and perhaps covered uh, this uh, large hole because you can see occasional picture where there's an entrance wound to the, of the skull. That is now a federal crime to shoot a president. 
right? And then therefore any president was shot, they would do an autopsy at Bethesda. But at that time, when that body was taken to Maryland, that body should not have been removed from Dallas, right? By That's law, right. it should not. Earl Rose was the uh, chief uh, medical examiner there. He was there. chasing the car. And uh, when you're murdered in Dallas County, the law is that you're autopsied in Dallas County. Now, they made him out to be a buffoon. Well, he tried to stop the uh, procession or the uh, casket being removed. He stood in front of it, but the Secret Service men were furious. They had failed in their job, and they weren't having any interruptions. And I remember very vividly one of them just taking him and smashing him against mm -hmm. the wall, and then the procession went out. I asked the others, Dr. Gieske, did you, did you, were you aware this is the, I mean, how did you feel? This is not just another patient. At the time, we were focused, of course, on trying to save a life. And I think all doctors who are presented in any situation, uh, they try to save the life first. After it was all over then, uh, and after the governor's anesthesia was over and we had him safely in the recovery room, we all kind of sat down and realized what we had done and that this was going to be a very historic thing. And Dr. Jenkins, um, requested that we all write down or dictate uh, notes mm. on on what we remembered or the details of what we remembered we all did that that appeared as a publication in Texas Medicine in January uh, 1964 and uh, it's quite moving to read Dr. Baxter is it true that you stopped the doctors from opening the chest for a heart massage yes because uh, because we knew then uh, from Dr. Clark that the head was essentially blown off, the brain was missing, and uh, there was no chance of survival. And to have opened his chest would really have been, uh, to my mind, malpractice. Who told Mrs. Kennedy, Dr. Jones? Well, I think she was in the, the room and probably knew, she likely knew when he arrived uh, in the emergency room. Uh, but after I put in a left chest tube and Dr. Baxter and Dr. Uh, Peters put in a right chest tube, I think that's when we hooked up the EKG machine. And all this was done within a matter of uh, less than 10 minutes. Did someone tell her, though? Dr. Dr. Clark told her because he had declared her dead. And he Him went dead. over and he comforted her as best he could. She had been crying. She had brain and blood on her pink dress. And uh, he, he told her. Let me get a break. In a little while, Dr. Charles Petty will be added to the panel. We thank Dr. Adolf Gieske for joining us. The rest of the panel will remain. We'll return right after this. best investigators can figure, he moved the boxes around to block anyone's view if someone had come up uh, somewhere in the room and, had, and, and had looked over in that area. So if he sat and waited behind these boxes, no one would see him. Uh, you know, it, it could have been that one of his co-workers who were waiting for him on the floor below, uh, one of his co-workers you know, might have come up and, and noticed him. But uh, of course, as we know now, that did not happen. By the way, if you're in Dallas, you must visit that museum. You've been there, how about it? Yes, and they, uh, can I just say a word about that, Larry? Because this is a wonderful thing that they've done, and, and they could have really made a mess of this. There were people in Dallas that wanted to bulldoze that building. They wanted to forget about this. But wiser heads prevailed. They have made this a place of scholarship. It's done with great dignity. And in a democracy, we need accurate history. And that's what this museum is all about. We agree 100%. A beautiful memorial in the middle, too. And by the way, we understand, uh, Gary, that the Sixth Floor Museum has an exhibit called Remembering Jack, Intimate and Unseen Photographs of the Kennedys. It explores that, the right. life of JFK through the photographs of Jacques Lowe 
and there's a book being released in conjunction with it. Is that right? That's true. Uh, Jacques Lowe was the Kennedy family's uh, favorite photographer, and he shot over 40,000 pictures. All those original negatives were stored in a building right next to the World Trade Center in New York, and those negatives were vaporized. So what, oh. survives, what survives today are contact sheets, you know, little tiny uh, images made directly off the negatives before they were destroyed. And uh, through computer enhancement, they've been sharpened and, and cleared somewhat. So at least they survive in that manner. Dr. Uh, Jones, did the FBI and Secret Service come into that room? There were probably agents in the room behind me. That room was so full of, of people because they didn't know who needed to be in and who didn't need to be in. But there were... I think the president's doctor was in there, as well as agents in there. Did you speak to them? I spoke to them as I left the room. After we had noted that he was dead for sure, I walked out of the room and I was immediately met by a gentleman who had a badge in the palm of his hand that literally filled it and he said, I'm with the FBI and I need to know the condition of the president so I can call J. Edgar Hoover. And that's when I realized that I was probably the first one out of the room and this had not been announced and no one knew that he was dead. I walked just a few more feet and another individual came up and said, I'm with the Secret Service and I need to tell Joseph Kennedy the condition of his son. And I tried to take them to a, to a telephone in the emergency room. Dr. Grossman, did a priest come and give last rites? Yes. Was, that, was he at the hospital at the time? or the I don't know if he was or not. When he was announced dead, what, what happened in the room? What, was there, the, the, what did everybody do? Gloves <clears throat> I come think off? The people, I think people were just emotionally drained. I think people looked at each other. And I think there, there was no organized plan, Ron, was there? I think people just out of respect felt they should just leave. Well, I had, I had left before the priest uh, arrived, and so I didn't see him come in. We were merely told uh, before we did a little bit of closed chest massage that uh, Mrs. Kennedy did not want him pronounced until the priest arrived. Was there anybody else in the emergency room that day, Dr. Baxter, or other people being treated? Oh, in the emergency room, yes. It was full, uh, but you didn't see any of them because the, F the Secret Service had virtually emptied the hallways uh, so that uh, when you entered the room there was only FBI people or Secret Service people that contacted you all the way from the door into the room. But I mean if someone were having and, a heart uh, attack would they have been treated well that day? Yes, there was plenty of personnel around to take care of them. Uh, a certain number went with Mr. Johnson to another part of the emergency room, uh, principally, I think, because no one knew if this was a conspiracy or what it was, yeah. and they wanted to isolate uh, Mr. Johnson from what was going on with the president and Mr. Conley. Now, Gary, you theorize that the Dallas police may have unknowingly had tapes of this, uh, audio tapes of the shooting? Explain. Well, back in the mid-70s, I heard a tape recording of the Dallas Police radio broadcast, and the, uh, there was an open microphone for about six or seven minutes before, during, and after the assassination, and the conspiracy folks thought that this was done deliberately to block communications. I just asked what to me was a very simple question, where is the open microphone? And the answer uh, was that, well, we think he was in the motorcade. So I said, well, if, if he's in the motorcade, then the shots have to be here also in this recording. So this eventually went to the House Assassinations Committee. They hired some experts to uh, analyze the recording, and the analysis came back. There were four shots, not three, and of the four, the third came from the grassy knoll. Based primarily on that, the House Assassinations Committee concluded there was a conspiracy to kill the president. Then uh, That was in 1979, and in 1982, a follow-up study said, well, there are no shots on here at all. So what we have now is you know, two groups of experts. They both stand by what they did, and who, who do you believe? What do you believe? I think the guys that got it right uh, uh, were the first ones. Four uh, shots. Uh, that's right, but that's, all, that's only because I, I've gotten to know those gentlemen. I understand how they applied the work, and there's some photographic uh, confirmation that shows that the officer in question could have been in the right place at the right time. Unfortunately, like a lot of things with the Kennedy assassination, that's not definitive either. Bob, you think we'll ever know 
a whole too no. many people gone now. Huh? No, I, I think we won't. I mean, it's uh, so much time has passed. Um, my own view is that I believe that Lee Harvey Oswald fired the shot. Uh, I have not yet heard enough evidence to convince me that somebody else may have helped him, but I'm, I'm keeping an open mind about that because uh, at this point, who can say? What was Dallas like when you reached the city? Oh, it was just total bedlam, Larry. I mean, again, it was confusion. People, the thing that it's hard for us to understand now is we hadn't been through anything like this. You know, we can all remember everything about that day, where we were, what we were doing, but when we got to Ronald Reagan and, and when that fellow shot at Ronald Reagan, there had been so much violence since that day in Dallas that we have to stop and think where we were. We'd almost, it's sad yeah. to say, we'd almost, almost become like used to it. it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Shifa, you're driving along with Mrs. Oswald. Is she talking to her about her son? Yes, and it was one of the most bizarre conversations I've ever had. Um, some of the things she said, uh, I mean, here the president is not his body is not yet cold, and, and, and she's talking about how everybody will feel sorry for his wife and give her money, and no one will give her money, and she'll starve to death. And the things she said were so outrageous that I did not put them in the story that I wrote in the Star-Telegram the next morning. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I thought this poor woman is under this emotional pressure. and. I probably should have done it. He was because, sitting on a major exclusive. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. Well, I wrote a pretty long story about it, uh, but uh, I, I just I thought I, I I can't do this. And and as I came to understand, the woman was totally fixated on money, and I, and I should have done it. Doctor Jones, you treated Lee Harvey Oswald two days later. Yes. We. Uh, I was out at Parkland uh, staffing a, a stab wound to the neck, which turned out to be a negative exploration. I was in the office in the operating room, and a phone call came in, and the nurse oh spoke for just a few minutes, or just a few seconds, and turned to me and said, Dr. Jones, they've shot Oswald, and they're bringing him to the emergency room. This ambulance comes to the same emergency entrance to which President Kennedy was brought on Friday. Through the same entrance now goes the man accused of assassinating the president. And I had seen Dr. Perry and Dr. Jenkins in their office uh, just up the hall, and I went up there and told them that he had been shot. And Did you go see him? We went down the uh, elevator to the emergency room and actually arrived before Oswald arrived, and they wheeled him into the room. He was not moving and couldn't tell that he was breathing much, but this time I listened to the chest and he did have a heartbeat, so we knew he was alive. And Dr. Jenkins intubated him. I did a venusection in the same, oh, same vein, the left arm as had been on President Kennedy, and I put a chest tube in on the left side because he had an obvious entrance wound just above the rib cage on the uh, left. What killed him? Massive blood loss. He, uh, if you remember when he was, when Ruby shot him, uh, he turned right. like this, and that went right through the back portion of the of the abdominal area and did major vascular injury. He'd been better off taking the shot straight on, and uh, we had him to the operating room within about uh, seven or eight minutes from the time he hit the emergency and room. And he died how soon thereafter? He lived about an hour and fifteen minutes. We, uh, an hour or so, we, the operation started at 11.42, I believe, and he was pronounced dead, as you saw on the blackboard, at 1.07 uh, p.m. And he had uh, injuries to his left chest, his diaphragm, his spleen. It blew a major artery off his aorta, the superior mesenteric artery, into the right renal artery and the right kidney, and the bullet came to lodge, and the vena cava also and came to lodge just under the skin on the right side. The whole world went mad that weekend. We'll be right back. This is the basement floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It seems to concern photographers. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. We're going to. Oswald has been shot. We're going to switch now. This is the approximate location where a bystander named Jim Tague stood. And while he was watching the motorcade approach him on, on uh, Elm Street, when the shot started, one of the shots struck this curb near here and splattered and cut him on this right cheek. The single bullet theory explains the shooting in light of the fact that a bystander was also wounded. Investigators found three empty shells up in the book depository and presumed only three shots were fired. 
One shot hit President Kennedy in the head. That's very visible in, these, in the Zapruder film. Another shot missed and struck the curb here and wounded the bystander. Therefore, one bullet must, the remaining bullet must have done all of the other damage, which was through Kennedy's upper back, out his throat, into Texas Governor John Connolly, through the top of his wrist, out the bottom of his wrist, and into his left thigh. We're back. We're going to spend a few moments now at Parkland Hospital with Dr. Charles Petty. He was not in Dallas that day. He, in the late 70s, though, as chief medical examiner for Dallas County, he was a member of a medical panel that reviewed the assassination for the House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassinations. What conclusion did you come to, Dr. Petty? Uh, well, there are a number of conclusions. I think the most important was that uh, Kennedy was struck by two bullets, both entering from the back. Do you buy any of this single bullet theory hitting him and Connolly? Oh, yes, absolutely. How does that happen? Because yes, I do. Nellie Connolly said that would be virtually impossible for the bullet to hit both of them because John Connolly was turning. Well, uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, the bullet that struck uh, Mr. Conley obviously was traveling at a relatively low velocity. It had lost some of its velocity in going through uh, President Kennedy. Uh, then it went on and did not penetrate the chest as has been reported. It skirted around the chest following the curvature of the rib and then it had enough velocity to go through uh, the governor's wrist and then still enough to strike uh, and wound him in the thigh. There is still controversy over the autopsy in Bethesda. Have you seen it? I have seen the autopsy report, yes. Is it well done? Is it conclusive? I thought it was done under, under a great deal of difficulty because the uh, autopsy surgeon did not have complete control of the autopsy room. I think that in itself the autopsy was well done. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that and well reported. In retrospect, what should have been done differently? In retrospect, yeah. I believe that uh, Commander Hume should have had complete control of the autopsy room, which he did not because of the much high brass that was present there. Secondly, in retrospect, I believe that uh, the uh, people, the physicians who worked with both of them uh, in the uh, um, Parkland Hospital area should have been taken out to Bethesda and been there at the time of the autopsy. Dr. Jones, you concur? That would have certainly helped the communication helped. of knowing that he had been shot in the back and them knowing that he had a, a wound in the front of his uh, neck. But I, I think the, the single bullet theory uh, requires a lot of, lot of assumptions. And then after you go through the fact that it, that it made all the wounds for Kennedy and for uh, and, and Governor Connolly, then he's brought in on a stretcher. His clothes are taken off after he's resuscitated. A sheet's placed over him. He's taken on that stretcher up to the operating room. He's transferred onto an OR table. Jane Wester, the nurse, folds the sheets up. No one has seen a bullet during that entire time. His clothes are in a brown paper bag on the lower part of the stretcher, so he, they're not on the stretcher. The stretcher's taken back down the elevator and parked at the elevator unattended for a while. And then as Mr. Tomlinson comes up and moves the stretcher, a bullet falls off that no one's ever seen. Dr. Baxter, you think you should have been at the autopsy? I think it would have helped. It would have been uh, at least uh, a little additional information for the commander. Dr. Grossman? They should have given them more time. The drawings were done very hastily. There's no accurate marking of dimensions. The photographs are out of focus. They should have had time to develop them. What and was check the rush? Them. That's the question. I don't know. The president put a rush on it, didn't he, Bob Schieffer? Didn't Johnson say, I want this out 
fast. I believe that's correct, Larry, but <clears throat> I was not here in Washington. I was back at, at the Dallas police station when all that part was going on. So with I'm, the, I'm not with the press murmuring about all this conspiracy? No, what, what we were trying to do was we were trying to, to find Oswald and talk to him. I had, when I had arrived uh, with Oswald's mother, I didn't tell the Dallas police uh, who I was. I was a reporter. I just let them assume I was a detective. In fact, I asked if they had a little room you where I could shopping. put, put Mrs. You Oswald. You press people. So the, yeah, exactly. So, well, it was a little different day. Uh, and in fact, they found me a, a room for her. And uh, late in the day, um, I asked uh, Captain Will Fritz if it would be possible for her to see Oswald. And, and they took us all into a little holding room off the jail. And uh, they were going to bring him down. And finally, someone, for the first time, somebody asked me who I was. And uh, he uh, told me I'd have met him. He told me I'd better excuse myself immediately, which I proceeded to do. Dr. Petty, do you think we'll, we'll, we know the whole story or we'll never know the whole story? I suppose there are details we will never know. But I think basically the story has been pretty well told. Thank you very much, Dr. Petty, for joining us, and we'll wrap the things up in our final moments with Bob Schieffer, Dr. Ronald Jones, Dr. Charles Baxter, Dr. Robert Grossman, and Gary Mack. We'll be right back. Find out how each of our panelists feels now, 40 years later. Do you think about it a lot, Dr. Jones? Well, you certainly think about it at the time of the anniversaries, and perhaps this is the most uh, that uh, the United States has thought about this, is at the 40th anniversary. What about you, Robert? I, um, I think about it a lot. Uh, I must say, Larry, that it took me weeks to realize how drained of emotion that I was after going through this. Like the doctors, reporters concentrate on what's in front of them to try to get the job done. You don't realize until later uh, the significance of what, what you've been involved in. But the way I felt during those days, I never felt that way again until 9-11. Uh, these are, are two stories that uh, I hope to God I'll never experience that kind of feeling again. Dr. Baxter, was there any other major emergency at Parkland that day? Mm, no, I don't think so. We were so concerned with Mr. Connolly after the president was pronounced dead uh, that that consumed the rest of the afternoon. How did you come to curate, be curator at the museum, Gary? Well, I've been contacted as a, as a consultant when the museum was in its planning stages, and I knew a little bit about the films and photographs that were available, so they needed someone like me to, to help tell the story eventually when the museum opened. So it, it, went, it developed that way. Are you still looking for any memorabilia, or do you have everything? Oh, we, we, we're looking for everything we can find, especially the films and photographs. And just a year ago, a man walked in with 17 photographs he'd taken in Dealey Plaza before, during, uh, before and after the assassination. He didn't think those pictures were important, but for, for history, they're, they're invaluable, and he donated them to us. Speaking of pictures, I had a picture taken of Trauma Room 1 about three or four weeks after it, so that picture is available, although Trauma Room 1 is is no longer there. I do have a, a photo of it as it mm. was at, at that time. What's at Parkland now where this was? I went there myself a few weeks ago. Trauma Room 1 is no longer there. It's a plaque on the wall and there is a waiting room for the x-ray department where Trauma Room 1 was. But the new Trauma Room 1 I also took a picture of doesn't mm. look too different from the old one. <laughs> Equipment's a little more modern but about the same size. There's nothing in the equipment and advances we've made today. Is there, Dr. Jones? I don't want to make a statement. I'll ask him. That could have saved him. No, he had such a, an injury to the brain that, uh, that I think that would have been a, a lethal wound. But we didn't know that at the time that we started the resuscitation. And it was only later that that, that was determined. Anything today might have saved Oswald? No, I don't think so. Again, the amount of trauma, blood loss is too great. Did, did the hospital ever recover? 
you know, did, did it leave this imprint for days and months around, did people talk about it, think about it, cafeteria, walking around the hospital? You were the most famous hospital in the world. Yeah, well, we, were, we became known as a trauma hospital after that, and we wrote a, a, one of the first trauma books on, on care of the trauma patient. We, we learned some things from this, and we uh, implemented hotlines where red phones where you could call out and call in because when the Secret Service and FBI wanted to call out you couldn't get a line out. Uh, we established a, a trauma research uh, center there. Uh, better communication. We established an ambulance service in the other early 70s. So a lot of things came out of this that, that we learned from. Now, Larry, I don't think America uh, was ever quite the same uh, after that day. I think that was the day that we lost our innocence, really. Uh, the way we covered the news changed, uh, the way we came to think of our presidents. Up until that point, we thought they were larger in life, almost bulletproof. We learned that they were, were mortal men. And it, I think, began what was years of cynicism, because after that came Watergate, and Vietnam, and all of that. Uh, it's a testament to the strength of this country that it didn't come apart during those Those, those days. pictures being it. <laughs> At the World Trade Center. Yes, just one more of these odd little links, things that happen that are connected to the assassination. Thank you all very much for sharing these memories with us. I'll be back and tell you about tomorrow night, right after these words. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock. Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Larry King Live. Stay tuned now for news around the hour on your most trusted name in news, CNN. For all of my guests and yours truly, good night. The trend of the clearing, uh, whether it is clearing or not. Yeah. We didn't mention the president, the governor, Connolly. No. No. They are now uh, taking care of the compound fracture of the right radius. As soon as that fi is finished, he will be taken to the recovery room where he will be carefully watched until he has regained all of his vital signs. Now, his vital signs are good now, but we like to observe them for a period of time. This is a routine measure until blood pressure is stable, respirations are satisfactory, and until the governor is uh, fully recovered from the anesthesia. In other words, he's fully conscious, responding rationally to questions. Uh, this is being taken care of. The bullet is in the leg. It hasn't been removed. This is a very insignificant factor, though. It will be removed. Left eye, but there's no significant injury to the left eye before he goes to the recovery room. His vital signs are good now, but we like to observe them for a period of time. This is a routine measure until blood pressure is stable, respirations are satisfactory, and until the governor is uh, fully recovered from the anesthesia. In other words, he's fully conscious, responding rationally to questions. They are asking now if a bullet was found uh, in his leg. The bullet is in the leg. It hasn't been removed. This is a very insignificant factor, though. It will be removed. Left eye, but there's no significant injury to the left eye before he goes to the recovery room. It was asked, when will it be removed? Hmm? They're not asking, will, uh, will he stay at this hospital?